Well, welcome everybody. I'm Pat Reedy. I'm the, the Vice President of Mission and Faith at J. Sarah Catholic High School. It's great to see so many friendly faces out there and familiar faces. And it's great to see some of you who maybe haven't been able to, to join us for an Adelante event this year. I want to briefly introduce Dr. Sachs so we can get into his talk. Um, Dr. Sachs came today to, to speak to our young men about being a man of integrity and the dangers of pornography. He did that um, in one fell swoop to all of our gentlemen on campus, all 600 of them in our gym. So you can follow up with your sons about that at home to see how they respond to that. Um, and we also did a podcast um, on another topic, just parents as the primary educators of their children that will probably be released sometime early next week for more of his wisdom. But um, Dr. Sachs has been on campus now eight or nine times. Every year he speaks to our freshman parents at our freshman parent orientation the week before school starts, which is a great gift, but he's never shared our, uh, with our parents about this topic. Why gender matters. And that was a dramatic pause, I guess, for effect. <clears throat> Am I supposed to slow down, Brennan? Is that what you're saying? Dr. Leonard Sachs, he, Dr. Leonard Sachs did his undergraduate at MIT. He will confess to you that he did not like MIT. So he decided to get out of there as quickly as he could with a degree, and he finished his, his bachelor's there by the age of 19. And then he went to University of Penn, where he got an MD and also simultaneously um, obtained his PhD in psychology. Um, he opened up a private family practice as a doctor in 1990, and he's been serving families and teenagers in his practice ever since then. Um, a little over 20 years ago, Dr. Sachs, recognizing the decline in adolescent academic performance and in their social and emotional well-being, especially relative to other countries, decided to do some of his own research. And he started to travel the nation and ultimately the world. And over the last 20 plus years, he's visited over 500 schools, not 50, but 500 schools, um, to do his own research on why the young people of the United States are lagging in so many ways. And then he spent the last couple decades publishing, writing um, several books that you'll, you'll see here to my left, to your right, and speaking nationwide and outside the nation on the conclusions that he's drawn about these topics, and that's what he's gonna share about with us tonight. He has been, um, made dozens of television appearances from the, the Today Show to the BBC, and he's also published four books uh, girls, boy, girls on boys, boys adrift. Girls on the edge. I usually get this. I got it every time today. Um, the collapse of parenting, which is his New York Times bestseller, and why gender matters is the book he's going to share about today. So, without further ado, I give you Dr. Leonard Sachs. Well, thank you, Pat, and certainly. Uh, uh, a real thank you to Pat and Eric Stroop, uh, principal, and and uh, Rich Meyer, president, for giving me this opportunity to return to this school. I prepared a handout for you. I'm going to be citing a great deal of research over the next uh, 90 some minutes, and making a lot of recommendations based on the research. The links to the research, the citations, and the recommendations are all in your handout. I'll show you this link again. You don't need it now. I would encourage you not to pull it up now. It's many pages. It's designed for a laptop or larger screen, but I just want you to know that there is a handout so you don't feel like you have to take a lot of notes. So I wanna begin with what we know about sex differences in vision and why they matter. And I cite 12 studies in which researchers gave young children, uh, three, four, five, six years of age, a choice of playing with a doll or a truck. Each of these studies is a little different but basically, uh, the re researchers give kids a choice of playing with what you might call a girl toy, like a Barbie doll, and a boy toy, like a little toy dump truck. Uh, so this is what kids do. This is Sherry Berenbaum, Melissa Hines. Uh, so the lighter gray color is the amount of time spent playing with the doll. The darker gray is the amount of time spent playing with the truck. These are girls. Girls spend more time playing with the doll but they do spend time playing with the truck and there's a lot of variation among the girls. The boys spend much more time playing with the truck than they do with the doll. That's not a new finding. I first encountered studies like these 40 years ago when I was 
earning my doctorate in psychology at Penn, I took a graduate seminar in developmental psychology with the late Justin Ehrenfried. And Professor Ehrenfried showed us some of these studies, a few of which had been published back 40 years ago. And he said, why is this? Why do girls slightly prefer to play with dolls and boys greatly prefer to play with trucks? He said, it's because of the social construction of gender. He said, we teach girls that girls are supposed to play with dolls. And by three, four, five years of age, the girls understand they're supposed to play with dolls. So on average, they're more likely to play with dolls than they are with trucks. But Professor Ehrenfried said, we send a much stronger message to boys than we do to girls. We teach boys, boys are absolutely supposed to play with trucks and never play with Barbie doll. So the boy picks up the Barbie doll, realizes it's a Barbie doll, and drops it like a hot potato. There's very little variation among the boys in how much time they spend playing with the Barbie doll. I didn't question that or challenge it. I don't know of anyone who did back then. Um, 40 years ago, there was agreement that sex differences in the play preferences of little kids are due to the social construction of gender. You know, I've been giving some version of this talk now for more than 20 years, and I'm convinced that you will never resolve this question of nature versus nurture if you look only at human data. In all four of my books, I cite lots of research with other primates, especially other hominids. Hominids are human, chimpanzee, gorilla, bonobo, orangutan. I share more of my DNA with a male chimpanzee than I do with a female human. And that's not just me. That would apply to every man in this room. <laughs> now, hopefully that doesn't mean I'm more like a chimpanzee than like a human, but in some respects, such as how I perceive a landscape, I may have more in common with a male chimpanzee than with a female human. Jerry and Alexander was the first to come up with the idea of giving the same choice to monkeys. Give juvenile monkeys a choice of playing with a doll or a truck and her findings have subsequently been replicated by Kim Wallen, we're looking at a different species of monkey, and Richard Rangham in observations of chimpanzees. Here are the monkey data. The female slightly but not significantly prefers to play with a doll rather than a truck. The male significantly prefers to play with the dull gray truck rather than the colorful doll. Now you could try to invoke the social construction of gender to explain this finding. You'd have to assert that the monkey in authority is saying something like, now son, don't let me catch you playing with no doll. <laughs> but this does not happen. The monkey in authority is paying no attention to the choices made by the juveniles. It makes no difference whether you conduct the study in isolation or in the colony. You cannot plausibly invoke the social construction of gender to explain the finding that juvenile male monkeys prefer to play with trucks rather than dolls. You can invoke the social construction of gender to explain the difference across species. The main effect, which is the preference of the juvenile male to play with a dull gray truck rather than a doll, is more pronounced in our species than it is in monkeys. Why? Because of the social construction of gender. Or as Dr. Melvin Connor at Emory has said in explaining precisely this finding, he says, culture stretches biology, culture stretches biology. What Dr. Conner means by that is that the main effect, the preference of the juvenile male to play with a dull gray truck rather than a doll, must be biological, must be hardwired, must be innate, because it's conserved across four primate species, human, chimpanzee, and two species of monkey. It's more pronounced in our species than it is in monkeys because of the social construction of gender, because the social construction of gender exaggerates and exacerbates that main effect. Oh, cool. Okay, that's plausible. But we still have not explained the main effect. Why is it the case that juvenile males, whether human, chimpanzee, or monkey, prefer to play with a dull gray truck rather than a colorful doll? Jaron Alexander was the first to describe this finding in a non-human primate and the first to suggest a plausible explanation. And it's her explanation that many parents, many teachers have found very useful in working with girls and boys. So I think it's useful to understand what she's saying. To understand what Professor Alexander is saying, you have to recall what you learned about the human visual system, and this is also true of chimpanzees and monkeys, back when you were in high school. You learned about the photoreceptors, the cells that convert light into a signal the brain can understand, the rods and the cones. You recall that the rods are black and white sensitive, and they're all through the retina. The cones come in three varieties, red, green, and blue, and they're concentrated at the center of the field of vision. You may recall that the next layer in the retina are the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells also come mostly in two varieties, 
little cells and big cells. It's 40 years now since Leslie Ungelider and her colleagues demonstrated that there are two visual systems in the brains of all higher primates, human, chimpanzee, and monkey. One visual system arises from the little ganglion cells, and it's answering the question, what? What is its color? What is its texture? The other visual system is arising from the big ganglion cells, and it's answering the question, where? Where is it going? How fast is it moving? Is it changing direction? Is it colliding with anything? So there's an old slide, Pascal Rakic and his colleagues, Yale University School of Medicine, mapping out the human visual system. The little ganglion cells send their information to the P or parvocellular division uh, of the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then onto Broadman area 17 in human occipital cortex. The big ganglion cells send their information to the M or magnocellular division of lateral geniculate, and then onto HOC5, area five of human occipital cortex. Two visual systems operating in parallel, one communicating information about color, detail, and texture, the other communicating information about speed, direction, collision, change in direction. Nothing new about that. That's been established doctrine in neuroscience for 40 years. Jaron Alexander was the first to assert that the M system greatly predominates in primate males, and the P system slightly predominates in primate females. Now, when she first made that suggestion 20 years ago, it was a guess, a hypothesis. But over the last 20 years, we've gotten a great deal of research that provides strong support for her hypothesis. For example, Katrin Amundsen and her colleagues in Dusseldorf, Germany, taking slices through HOC5, that area at the back of the human brain that's looking for speed, direction, collision. And you can take a slice through a human brain at HOC5, hold the slide up to the light, and say without error whether that piece of brain came from a man or a woman because the organization of the brain is so radically different in those two areas. There is no overlap between the sexes, even after adjusting for any size differences. Robert McGivern and his colleagues working with students at university, students sitting in front of a computer on the screen, there's an object which is changing direction, changing shape, changing speed, changing color, and then it vanishes. And yes, a student at the moment the object vanished, match its color, match its shape, match its speed, match its direction. You find that women do much better than men at matching color and shape. Men do better than women matching speed and direction. These studies and many others like them provide strong support for Jerry and Al Alexander's hypothesis. Why is it the case that girls slightly prefer to play with a doll rather than a dull gray truck? Jerry and Alexander would say it's because the doll has a more interesting color and texture. Why do juvenile males, whether human, chimpanzee, or monkey, greatly prefer to play with a dull gray truck rather than with a colorful doll? Jaron Alexander would say, because it's got wheels. It goes kaboom. <laughs> now, at this point, you're thinking, this is a complete waste of my time. <laughs> you're thinking, you know, the door is open. I could sneak out without making a noise, and maybe I will, because I don't see how, I can see how this might be of some interest if I were a neuroscientist interested in sex differences in the primate visual system, but I'm not. I'm a parent of a four-year-old. And I don't see how all this talk about magnocellular and parvocellular, how is this going to be helpful to me as a parent of a four-year-old? Well, I want you to imagine that you are a parent of a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old of a boy and a girl. And you've given your, kid a, your kids a blank piece of white paper and a box of crayons. And you said to your kid, draw whatever you want. Draw whatever you want. Psychologists call this free drawing. I cite five studies in which researchers did exactly this. Gave uh, kids a blank piece of white paper and a box of crayons and asked them to draw whatever you want. One from the United States, one from England, one from South Africa, one from Japan, and one from Thailand. What happens when you give kids a blank piece of white paper and a box of crayons and you ask them to draw whatever they want? What do girls draw? Girls draw people, pets, flowers, and trees. Typically two, three, or four arranged on a horizontal ground. The people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The girls use 10 or more crayons with a predominance of red, orange, yellow, green, beige, and brown. And this is true of essentially every girl, including the girl who hates dolls and would rather play basketball. She's still drawing a human figure on a horizontal ground with eyes and clothes. What do boys draw? It's complicated. Boys form a bimodal distribution of variants, which is highly kurtotic and skewed, which is a fancy way of saying the boys form two clumps, 
one big peak and one little peak. In each of these five studies, about 8% of boys, roughly 1 in 12 boys, pretty much draw what the girls draw. They draw people, pets, and trees, arranged on a horizontal ground with eyes and clothes. It turns out that boys who draw people, pets, and trees have a lot in common with other boys who draw people, pets, and trees. They're at least three times more likely than other boys to have allergies, asthma, or eczema sufficiently severe to warrant ongoing consultation with a physician. They may be athletic, but they're not playing football or ice hockey. They're playing tennis, track, or golf because they don't like to hit and they don't like to be hit. And they're much more likely beginning in middle school to become victims of bullying because a favorite game among middle school boys one boy comes up to the other and says, hey, how about I hit you as hard as I can, then you hit me as hard as you can. And this boy says, but I do not want to hit you, and I don't want you to hit me. And he runs off and boom, marks himself as a victim of bullying. I want you to imagine two boys. Let's call them Brett and Michael. Brett is all boy, likes to hit, loves football. Michael doesn't like to hit, doesn't like football, would much rather color a picture of the flower. Brett, the football player, turns out to be gay. Michael, the artist, turns out to be straight. The binaries do not align. Gender is complicated. But just because gender is complicated doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It matters immensely. What do more than 90% of boys draw in each of these five studies? In each of these five studies, more than 90% of boys are not drawing people, pets, flowers, or trees. They're trying to draw a scene of action at a moment of dynamic change, like a monster eating an alien or a rocket smashing into a planet. <laughs> Human figures, if present at all, are often stick figures, lacking eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. It is not a well-organized two-dimensional picture on a horizontal ground. On the contrary, this boy has written the word tank, so you know there's a tank shooting at the plane going down in flames over, uh, the, uh, over the other tank. Then he's rotated his picture upside down and written the word died next to this soldier. <laughs> So you know the soldier has, in fact, died. Very Picasso-esque superimposition of multiple frames of reference, very characteristic of the drawings of boys. This finding is robust. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a Japanese girl in Japan, upper left, or an American girl in the United States, upper right. Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees arranged on a horizontal ground that people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. Now, I asked you to imagine that you have a son and a daughter and you've given them a white piece of paper, a box of crayons, and asked them to draw whatever they want. And you come to your daughter, upper right, and you say, Emily, this is lovely. What are you drawing here? Emily explains this is her, her little kidder, kitty, her little sister, and her sister's friend. That's great. I love all the colors and the faces. Carry on. Now you come to your son, and you say, great work, uh, Jason. What are you drawing here? Jason explains he's trying to draw a car crash at the moment of impact. This car is being crushed between these two. <laughs> now, you want to encourage all your kids, of course, but Jason's making it difficult. <laughs> you say, Jason, you know, a car crash, that's really violent. People are going to get killed or paralyzed. And, and Jason, sweetie, I don't, I don't see any people in your vehicles. Your cars are all empty. <laughs> now, look at your sister's drawing. It's so nice, and no one's getting killed or paralyzed. Why'd you draw something so violent? Now you come over to Damien. Damien did the picture at lower left. And you say, great work, Damien. But you know, Damien, you have a whole box of crayons. Why don't you draw the vehicle same color as the sky? And, and why don't you use more colors? And I don't see any people in your vehicle. Why don't you put some people in there? There's one thing girls and boys are equally good at at every age, as near as we can tell. And that's figuring out what you like, what the grown-ups like. I was in, I was observing a second grade classroom. And the teacher said, free time, you can do whatever you want. And some of the girls were sitting and coloring. And one of the boys was running around the room making a buzzing noise. And I got in his way and I stopped him. I said, how come you don't want to sit and draw? And the boy said, without hesitation, he said, drawing's for girls. Drawing is for girls. Where do you get that idea? I'm sure the teacher never said drawing is for girls. But you might as well have, because by praising and understanding pictures that are all about color, detail, texture, and faces, but not really getting a, the point of a picture that's all about action, she is unintentionally sending the message that drawing is for girls. The lack of awareness of gender differences has the unintended consequence of reinforcing 
gender stereotypes. So what's best practice? Best practice is to understand what is the picture this boy is trying to draw and help him to draw it better. Turns out that Damien wants to make it look like his vehicle is going fast. So I submit that best practice here would be to say to Damien, okay, Damien, take your black crayon, show some stuff flying off the truck bed and take your gray can and show some sand spitting up from behind the wheels. And Damien will be encouraged. You've got to understand what is the picture this boy is trying to draw and help him to draw that picture better. So Jerry and Alexander was kind enough to read my discussion of her work in that chapter and she's given it her stamp of approval. She says, I have correctly understood her work. She agrees that most boys are trying to draw pictures that engage the magnocellular visual system that imply speed, collision, change of direction. Most girls are trying to draw pictures that engage the parvocellular visual system with color, detail, and texture. Well, that yields a hypothesis. If more grown-ups understood those differences, you could break down the gender stereotypes. You could have eight-year-old boys who love to draw as much as girls do. And that's not a hypothesis. That is a fact. Margaret Paula Ola's daughter superintends 17 schools across Iceland, mostly K-8 schools, and she and her teachers know all about Jerry and Alexander and the two visual systems. She sent 44 of her teachers to attend a two-day workshop I hosted in Chicago on this topic. She then sent 60 of her teachers to attend a two-day workshop I hosted in Orlando, Florida on this topic. And then in my invitation, she came to speak at our conference in Houston. She did a breakout session, which I attended. And she told us that since the teachers have had this training at each of her 17 schools today, when the teacher says free time, you can do whatever you want, the boy's favorite activity is drawing. Boys love to draw. Girls love to draw. I don't believe there's any innate difference between girls and boys and how much they love to draw. But there's a big difference in what they want to draw. And if you don't understand that, you end up with what we have, a country where many boys think drawing is for girls, where you, you go to the College Board website and look to see who took the advanced placement exam in art history last year. You find that girls outnumber boys by more than three to one, which is ironic in view of the fact that most of the artists they're studying are men. You've got to assess the boy's work from his perspective. What's the picture he wants to draw and help him to draw it better? So that's a quick look at sex differences in vision. Let's move on to something I would argue is even more relevant to parents, and that is sex differences in hearing. How loud is a sound? Loudness is a subjective experience. How does the subjective experience of loudness per, uh, comp relate to the objective physical amplitude of the sound? Well, that relationship was first worked out more than 60 years ago by Dr. J.J. Stevens at Harvard. The subjective experience of loudness is proportional to the objective physical amplitude of the sound raised to the value of N. Stevens called the, uh, the exponent, the loudness exponent, but everyone since then has simply called it Stevens N. It turns out that, and that number is always less than one, um, you have to measure it, it varies from one person to the next, and it turns out that it is consistently higher for females than for males on average. So in one study, the average value for women is significantly higher than the average value for men. In another study, they found even bigger differences uh, with the average value for women roughly three times that of the average value for men. And as the researchers recognize, that higher value of N means that women are gonna be more sensitive to a given sound than men are. They will experience that sound as being louder than males do. It's actually not a new finding. Diane McGinnis, 50 years ago uh, at Stanford, uh, 25 women, 25 men, uh, she measured sensitivity across the loudness, uh, across the frequency spectrum and found a difference again of about eight decibels, meaning you have to crank the sound up by about eight decibels in order for men to experience that sound as being loud as the women experienced. Colin Elliott, working with five-year-olds and 11-year-olds, similar finding, you had to crank the sound up by about nine decibels in order for the boys to experience a sound as being as loud as the girls experience. If you are a woman and you live with a man, you may be already familiar with this finding. If you share a car, 
with a man and you turn on the radio, you're like, whoa, he's got that thing cranked way up. Or you share a TV and you turn on the TV, it's like, whoa, he's got that thing blasting. What is wrong with him? Is he deaf? Well, maybe, or maybe the problem is that he is a man. The man is typically going to turn the volume dial up about eight decibels, about three clicks on a typical uh, stereo setting. If you are a man and you have a daughter, it's vitally important that you understand this difference. Hearing diminishes as a function of age. Children hear better than adults. And the average female hears better than the average male at every age. Now, I want you to imagine a 45-year-old father speaking to his 15-year-old daughter. This is an example from my own practice. A girl in my practice complained to me and said to me, she said, she said you know, my father's always shouting at me, and I, I don't like to be shouted at. So I come home, I find my way to my bedroom, I close the door, and I stay in my bedroom as much as possible. I try to avoid him because I don't like to be shouted at. So I bump into the father and I said, um, you know, dad, your, your daughter gave me permission to share with you. She said that you're always shouting at her. And he said, Dr. Sachs, I never once shouted that girl. You hear what I'm saying to you. And I said, yeah, I heard. Um, <laughs> and then I explained to him about sex differences in hearing that Girls hear better than boys, that women hear better than men, and also age differences. The children have more sensitive hearing than adults. And I said, I suggested to this father, you know, the next time you, you talk to your daughter, whisper. I mean, don't literally whisper, but lower your voice way, way down. And a few weeks later, I bumped into the daughter, and she said, she said, oh my goodness, my father can actually talk like a normal person. He was happy to make the accommodation. No one had ever told him that you need to lower your voice when you talk to your daughter. He's happy to do it. He's not aware. These hardwired sex differences are not well known, and they should be, because they can literally drive a family apart. Sex differences in smell. University of Pennsylvania researchers certainly take the lead in this uh, worldwide. Richard Doty, over many decades now, has led his colleagues around the world measuring sex differences in olfactory acuity. Olfactory acuity is the ability to detect odors, and they have found robust differences uh, in Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Africa, and Australia. Everywhere you look, you find that women are better able to detect odors than men are. Now, to understand the next slide, you need to know some basics about how we smell. You sniff, and olfactory receptors at the back of the nose, like the photoreceptors at the back of the eye, are converting that signal into brain, a signal the brain can understand. That information is then processed in the olfactory bulb, which is part of the brain, at the base of the brain. And uh, Richard Doty and his colleagues have led researchers looking at that anatomy. And they have found that the average woman has over 16 million cells in the olfactory bulb compared to only 9 million for the average man. The average woman has almost 7 million neurons in the olfactory bulb compared with half that number in the average man. Bish Dalton and her colleagues uh, on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania have found that with repeated exposure, the ability of women to detect odors increases by a factor of more than 100,000. How much does it increase in men? It does not increase at all. No increase over time in men, huge increase over time. That's a log scale graph in women. So another example from my own practice that illustrates this. Husband and wife go away on vacation and come home two weeks later. Well, it gets warm in Maryland in the summertime. And husband and wife walk back into their kitchen and the woman says, oh my gosh, something died, it rotted, I think I'm gonna throw up. And the man says, I'll smell anything. 
And as it happens, I saw both of them in my office over the next few days. And the woman said, okay, my husband is a barn animal because our entire kitchen reeks. It smells like a pig carcass rotting on a pile of manure. It's horrible. And he claims he doesn't smell anything. And I explained it to the wife, he's not claiming, he's telling the truth. He doesn't smell anything. You can't be angry with him any more than a sighted person can be angry with a blind person. And then the husband came in and he said, my wife's a witch, except he didn't, he didn't say witch. He used a different word. He said, she's going on and on and on about how the place stinks and we gotta hire somebody to rip open the wall and find out what's rotting it. And I, I don't smell anything. And I explained to him, you cannot argue with her any more than a blind person can argue with a sighted person. The smell is real, it's overpowering, it's intense. You don't smell it, you're gonna to have to hire the contractor who was hired and came and found a large dead rat decomposing in a pile of slime. If you are a mom and your son's room stinks and you say, it stinks in here, how can you stand it? And your son says, I don't smell anything. <laughs> he's not lying. He's not being defiant or disrespectful. He's telling the truth. He doesn't smell anything. So what should you say to him? Say to him, if you ever hope to live with a woman the standard of cleanliness which will apply is not your standard, but her standard. I would prefer that you not bring food back to your bedroom, but if you do, you have to remove the leftovers and not leave them under the bed for weeks. The lack of awareness of sex differences can create tension between mother and son, between husband and wife, and it's not necessary. You know, I've heard of many pastors who do premarital counseling for young men, young women preparing to marry. This should be part of it. This is something that I think every married couple needs to know, that they are experiencing different sensory worlds. Sex differences in brain development. So the world's largest study of brain development in children going on now for nearly 30 years. The same kid comes in year after year after you have, have their brain scan now more than 3,000 individuals, three through 30 years of age, showing dramatic sex differences in the trajectories of brain development. So the arrows indicate the halfway point in brain development. Girls reach the halfway point in brain development around 11 years of age, boys not until 15 years of age. That's more than two standard deviations of difference separating the average boy from the average girl. Sex differences between adults turn out to be small. Well, what is an adult? Well, based on the brain research, we can say an adult, a woman, reaches full maturity in brain development by 22 years of age. Boys don't reach full maturity in brain development until about 30 years of age. So that explains a lot, <laughs> you think about it. You'll sometimes hear in popular articles that humans reach maturity and brain development by about 25, 26 years of age. That number is an average. 22 plus 30 is 52. 52 divided by two is 26. Girls reach maturity by age 22. Boys not until 30 years of age. Sex differences between adults turns out to be quite small in most domains. How long can you sit still, be quiet, and pay attention? We find no difference comparing 22-year-old women with 30-year-old men. But if we talk about six-year-olds, how long can a six-year-old boy sit still, be quiet, and pay attention compared to a six-year-old girl? It's about half as long. By age 15, how long can a 15-year-old boy sit still, be quiet, and pay attention? only about 70% as long. He's 15 years old, he may look almost like an adult, but he's not. He's only halfway there, he's got another 15 years to go. So back in ancient times, 30 years ago, you would have heard people say things like, oh, girls have a better verbal ability and boys have better spatial ability. Bzz, wrong, not a true statement. Janet Sibley Hyde and her colleagues at University of Wisconsin-Madison did a number of studies throughout the 1990s that showed that's simply not true, those are socially constructed differences, there's nothing hardwired about them. 
And so a lot of people lost interest uh, because by 2000, really every uh, research psychologist had agreed that there are no hardwired sex differences in verbal or spatial ability. But then uh, Professor Baumeister came along. Professor Baumeister said, okay, so no big differences in cognitive ability between men and women, but there are big differences in motivation. In other words, the big differences between men and women are not in what they can do, but in what they want to do. And I hired Roy Baumeister to speak at a conference I hosted for teachers in Memphis, Tennessee. When Roy Baumeister speaks, he likes to talk about vacuuming under the sofa. So in the United States, who moves the sofa in their own home so as to vacuum underneath it? Women. Women are more likely than men are to move the sofa so as to vacuum underneath it. Why is that, Professor Baumeister asks. Is that, is that a matter of ability? Are men not capable of moving the sofa? No, they're perfectly capable of it. They just don't want to. The big differences between men and women, between girls and boys, are not in what they can do, but in what they want to do. And Professor Baumeister went on to write a book, Oxford University Press, exploring how these sex differences in motivation influence every human culture. And the book is great fun to read. The title is, is there anything good about men? <laughs> Researchers at Cambridge University in England looked at the vocabulary of 18-month-olds and found the average 18-month-old boy has a vocabulary about half that of the average 18-month-old girl. Average 18-month-old boy has a vocabulary of about 40 words. Average 18-month-old girl has a vocabulary of about 90 words. Huge difference. Be mindful. If you have an older daughter and a younger son, do not compare your son to your daughter or you'll be convinced that he is retarded. <laughs> an example from my own practice. Uh, a mother had an 18-year-old, 18 18-month-old 18 son and she said, you know, when my daughter was 18 months old, I'd bounce her on my knee and I'd say, goo goo gaga and she'd say, goo goo gaga and I'd say EEO, and she'd say EEO, and we could go on for 20 minutes doing that, just crack each other up, we had the best time. I tried doing that with my son at 18 months, just recently. And somebody rode their bicycle, and he's looking at that, and the house made a creak, and he's looking at that. He's highly distractible. And I Googled it, and it said that that could be a sign of autism. Do you think he's on the spectrum? I said, well, maybe, but it's also possible that he's a boy. Uh, but I could not reassure her. This was more than 20 years ago when I was less confident. She insisted on an evaluation. I should have talked her out of it, but I didn't. It's actually closer to 30 years ago. So I agreed to write a referral for her to take her son to the Treatment and Learning Center, TLC, Rockville, Maryland. Very fine experts in play-based assessment of toddlers. It was a really bad idea. She came back in tears. She said they're concerned. They are concerned. They said the average age month old child has a vocabulary of about 65 words. They estimate his vocabulary is only 40 words. They said he's significantly below average. Okay, the average 18 month old child has a vocabulary of about 65 words. That's a true statement. 40 plus 90 is 130, 130 divided by two is 65. The average 18 month old child has a vocabulary of about 65 words. That is a true statement, which is utterly meaningless because your child is not a child. They are a boy or a girl. Well, there is an exception to that. There is something called intersex where a child is both male and female like an XXXY chimera, an equal mixture of male and female cells, exceedingly rare. Less than two in 10,000 humans are intersex. Just Google the phrase, how common is intersex and my name, and you'll find the scholarly paper I wrote for the Journal of Sex Research, adding up all the uh, intersex conditions. The highest possible estimate is less than two in, in 10,000. So, and that's a very low number. It's roughly the same order of magnitude as conjoined twins, Siamese twins. It's very rare. 
For all practical purposes, every child you encounter is either a boy or a girl, and your own children are boys or girls, not both. The average boy has a vocabulary of about 40 words. He's not below average. He's typical. There's nothing wrong with him. Your norms must be norm to gender. So Judith Buckler, professor of comparative literature at Berkeley, has argued that male and female are not real because gender is not a fact. The various acts of gender create the idea of gender, and without those acts, there would be no gender at all. And her ideas are now accepted as authoritative at most leading schools of education, as well as every public school district in the state of California, of which I have any knowledge, and that's quite a few. Is it true? These researchers, an extraordinary uh, international collaboration between neuroscientists at Yale, Johns Hopkins, and National Institutes of Health, collaborating with neuroscientists in England, Germany, Croatia, and Portugal, working with 1,340 samples of precious human brain tissue taken from dead people, wanted to know what genes are active at what ages in the human brain at every age. So a mother is pregnant. She's in a car crash. She's dead. You take the dead baby from her womb, cut open its skull, take out the brain, and study the brain tissue. That's how you get early fetal tissue, mid-fetal, late-fetal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, every age. They mean every age, beginning with prenatal. And you find huge differences in gene activity within the brain prior to birth. The biggest differences in gene activity in brains related to cognition are prior to birth. These are boys, these are girls. Sex differences diminish as a function of age. There are no sex differences in adults in brain activity but huge sex differences prior to birth. You are born male or female. Again, huge sex differences in the fetal period. See if this is working again. Huge sex differences in the fetal period, no sex differences in the adult period. These links are all in your handout. These researchers used high-resolution MRI scans to look at the living baby in its mother's womb in the third trimester of pregnancy and found in some areas very rich connections in the female brain, such as the connection comp uh, connecting the left temporal pole with the posterior cingulate gyrus, very rich in the female brain, utterly lacking in the male brain, but other areas where the male brain had rich uh, collections, such as connect connections within the cerebellum uh, that are uh, very rich in the male brain, but much less evident in the female brain. And they concluded that uh, some of these dramatic sex differences that are rich in the female brain, almost completely non-existent in the male brain, and conversely, some areas where there were rich connections within the male brain utterly lacking in the female brain. Now, researchers have known for decades that there are dramatic sex differences in the brains of adults. But when they present those findings to followers of Judith Butler, Butler and her followers say, well, those are adults. They've been subjective to 20, 30, 40 years of the heteronormative patriarchy. So the differences we observe in the brain are merely the result of the heteronormative patriarchy. There's nothing hardwired about it. But these studies are not in adults. These are in babies prior to birth. And in my judgment, it is a compelling refutation of the claims by Judith Butler and her followers in the Los Angeles Unified School District who claim that gender is merely a social construct. I have debated followers of Judith Butler at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the University of Texas, Austin, and I present them with these findings and they are completely unaware of this research and they have no interest in it. Uh, they are quite convinced that um, gender is a social construct, 
uh, power structure created by the heteronormative patriarchy, and they have no interest in evidence to the contrary. I led professional development for a school in Austin, Texas, and one of the teachers there is earning a master's in education at UT Austin. And she went to her professor and said, I'd really like to give you my copy of Dr. Sachs's book. And she held out the book to her professor. And the professor looked at the cover, Why Gender Matters, What Parents and Teachers Need to Know About the Emerging Science of Sex Differences. And she told me the professor recoiled as if from an unclean thing and said, I have no interest in reading such sexist rubbish. Let's talk about the gender atypical male. I mentioned him earlier, the boy who likes to play with people, pets, flowers, and trees. About one in 12 boys. We know a lot about these boys. They've been studied now for more than 60 years, beginning with Patricia K. O. Sexton at NYU. And she and her colleagues measured testosterone levels. They thought maybe these boys have lower testosterone levels. Bzzit, no difference. But more recently, researchers have looked at the androgen receptor. So testosterone crosses into the cell and is reduced by the enzyme 5-alpha-dihydrotestosterone reductase to dihydrotestosterone, which then binds to the androgen receptor and activates it, whereupon it enters into the nucleus and can bind to the genome and change things. The androgen receptor gene, like every gene, is made up of codons. Codons normally code for one amino acid. I'm old enough to remember when researchers talked about junk DNA, because they knew there was lots of DNA that doesn't code for anything. And so they called it junk DNA. It's not junk. It has a very important function. Turns out that one end of the receptor, androgen receptor gene has a series of codons called CAG codons because it's a repeating string of cytosine, adenine, and guanine. They used to be called nonsense or junk DNA because they don't code for amino acids, but they regulate the gene activity. The average number of CAG codon repeats in humans varies from 8 to 31 with an average of 20. If a boy has a low number of CAG codon repeats, 8, 9, 10, 11, the androgen receptor is very active, and the boy will tend to be more masculine, likes to hit, likes to play football. If a boy has a high number of CAG codon repeats, uh, 27, 28, 29, 30, the androgen receptor will be less active, and he will be less masculine. This is a hardwired, innate difference. And I have counseled parents who don't understand this. One case vividly sticks in my mind. A father who was himself a football player, a lineman at university, who loves football, likes to hit, and had a son, and was crushed to discover early on that his son doesn't like to hit, doesn't like to play rough and tumble games, would much rather color a picture of a flower. And the father's like, what I do wrong? My son is a sissy. He doesn't like football. What did I do wrong? I said, you didn't do anything wrong. You need to celebrate and cherish the son you have. He's different. He's got different strengths. These boys typically do well in elementary school. They tend to be precocious, particularly with regard to language. They have lots of friends, most of whom are girls, and the teachers love them. The difference, difficulties for these boys begin in middle, middle school, at the onset of puberty. Girls figure out that your cool factor depends on who you hang with, and this boy is never the cool boy. He's the geek, and the girls leave, and the boy is alone. The great American songwriter Paul Simon was and is such a boy, and he wrote a very poignant song early in his life describing what it feels like. He said, I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving I disdain. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I'm shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one. No one touches me. I'm a rock. I'm an island. And a rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. 
So that's a few words about the gender atypical male. What about the gender atypical female and the girl who hates dolls who would rather play basketball or wrestle a hog? Uh, these women are celebrated. Uh, the first woman to, to command the space shuttle, uh, or ride a whale, or reach the South Pole, or climb Mount Everest. These girls are at lower than average risk of anxiety and depression compared to gender typical girls. They tend to do as well or better academically. Lucy hates pink, hates pastels, hates dolls and princesses, insisted on dressing up as Luke Skywalker for Halloween, likes to climb trees and whack people with lightsabers, loves bugs and slimes, slime. And the teacher asked mom, does Lucy want to be addressed as a boy? Is she going to transition? What are her pronouns? And mom said, she's not trans. She is a tomboy. Did you find a link to this article? My daughter's not trans. She's a tomboy in your handout. When we talk about sex, we're talking about male and female. About fewer than two in 10,000 humans are intersex, both male and female. We're not easily classified as either male or female. So sex is binary. You are either male or female, but gender is not binary. Gender is a continuum. The old notion 40 years ago was that it was a one-dimensional continuum. And to the extent that you were more masculine, you were necessarily less feminine. But that turns out not to be accurate, as research over the last 40 years have shown. Gender is not one-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. You can be masculine or not. You can be feminine or not. You can be both, which is androgynous. You can be neither, which is undifferentiated. And part of becoming a fulfilled human being is figuring out where do you belong on this two-dimensional space. Uh, each culture constructs gender differ differently. Uh, in Japan in 1603, Meticulous care in the preparation and serving of tea with great attention to color and texture would have been a male, masculine occupation. Women were prohibited to participate in tea ceremony in Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, mastery of the arts of war is primarily masculine in every culture of which we have substantial knowledge. So in my own marriage, I've been married for 34 years, and... I do all the grocery shopping. My ha wife hates to shop for groceries. Um, my wife mows the lawn, fixes the lawn tractor. I would have no idea how to fix a lawn tractor. And that's fine. That's fine. Gender is complicated. Male to female transgender is the individual born male who, as an adult, will seek male sexual partners male to female early onset, male to female late onset, typically a gender typical male, often an athlete or a warrior, soldier, typically pursuing a male typical pastime and as an adult intimate with women. Female to male early onset, almost always intimate with women as adults, female to male later onset, onset after the onset of puberty, what some call rapid onset gender dysphoria, sexual orientation varies. In that boy, born male, who says that he is a girl at three years of age, asks his mother at three years of age, when will his penis fall off? He has a high number of CAG codon repeats, 29, 30, 31, just as seen in the gender nonconforming boy. Evidence-based best practice is watchful waiting. Because he may grow to be uh, a gender nonconforming man, or a gay man, or transgender, but the great majority of these boys 20 years down the road, when they are 20, 23, 25 years of age, will not identify as female. The most common outcome is that they will be gay men. They're not women. They don't want to be women. They certainly don't want you to cut off their balls. They are gay men. 
Well, how do you distinguish whether this five-year-old is truly a trans girl or simply a gay boy? You'd have to ask about sexual orientation, but it is not age appropriate to ask a five-year-old or a seven-year-old about their sexual orientation. I vividly remember when I was seven years old asking my mom, I exact, remember exactly where I was standing in our house next to the spinet piano when I asked her, if I grew up and marry a woman, do I have to take my PJs off in bed with her? <laughs> and my mom said, yes, you will, but you'll want to. <laughs> and I said, no, I won't. Girls have cooties. And I turned out to be a straight man. And I am a gender atypical male. I continue to like ballet and glitter, but I am not a gay man, nor am I trans. Gender's complicated. There's more than one way to be a man. And the notion that your five-year-old has any clue what their gender is is utterly and profoundly contradicted by the science, of which we have quite a bit. I was consulted about a girl who always loved to play with dolls, a gender-typical girl, wanted to be a fashion designer, insisted on dressing up as a princess for every Halloween, and parents shared with me pictures of her dressed as a princess, which was the only uh, costume she would consider. At 14, she became depressed. And she saw a TikTok video that said, hey, if you transition to being a boy, you won't be depressed because girls are depressed and boys aren't. And she bought into it and other videos like it and announced to her parents that she wanted, that she was a boy and she wanted to transition. And the parents said, no, I understand you're going through a lot right now, but transitioning to being a boy and cutting off your breasts is not going to fix it. It's not the best thing for you. And the parents shared with me her drawings. This is a drawing she made. This is a drawing she made. Now, because you were here at the beginning of this talk, you understand those are girls' drawings. That's not a boy's drawing. That's a girl's drawing. That is the drawing of a gender-typical girl. And there she is. This girl's mistaken. She's not transgender. She is depressed. Evidence-based best practice for this girl who's struggling with depression and adjustment disorder would be appropriate medication and psychotherapy, but transitioning her to the male role and starting male hormones is not in her interest. She's mistaken, she's confused. 14-year-olds are often mistaken and confused. I wrote the first edition of Why Gender Matters 20 years ago as one paragraph on transgender because it wasn't a thing back then. Things have changed. So Gallup poll, who identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender? For old people, not many, and it's been pretty flat from 2012 through 2021. For millennials, born between 1981 and 1996, it's been rising, reaching 10% in 2021. For Gen Z, born between 1997 and 2012, 10% identified as LGBT in 2017. Four years later, that number had doubled to almost 21%. The American Psychological Association now defines transgender, quote, as an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to that typically associated with the sex to which they were assigned at birth. They're explicitly equating gender nonconforming with transgender. If you're gender nonconforming, according to this official definition, you are transgender. Wow, I'm trans, who knew? 
Most transgender kids are gender nonconforming, but most gender nonconforming kids are not transgender. I like ballet and macrame. I did macrame as a teenager. My wife fixes the lawn tractor and hates the shop. Our gender expression doesn't align with our sex at birth. So according to the official criterion of the American Psychological Association, we are both gender nonconforming, which according to the APA means we're both transgender. <laughs> As parents, you must be agents of reality, recognizing that everyone is a mix. And that's okay. There's more than one way to be a girl. There's more than one way to be a boy. We now have to fight against the experts who are preaching not based in evidence, but based in a ideology that has drifted very far left of center. We must teach kids that male and female are real, that every cell in your body is either XX or XY, that it is a biological impossibility to transition from being male to female or vice versa because you can't change yourselves from being XX to XY. You can mutilate your body, but you're not changing yourselves. We must teach kids that your sex does not limit your freedom of opportunity. The irony of the transgender movement is that it is hardening gender stereotypes. So now the girl who wants to be combat infantry People are saying, well, what are your preferred pronouns? Do you want to transition to the male role? Embracing equal opportunity does not require abandoning the reality of male and female. And we are failing at this tax, task, and the result is that many kids are confused. A study published last year found that gender surgeries, what we used to call sex change operations, we're now required to call them gender affirmation surgeries, nearly tripled from two th in three years' time, tripled in three years' time. Most of these are top surgeries. Most of these are girls, young women, undergoing bilateral mastectomy, including in California, girls as young as 12 years old, undergoing bilateral mastectomy. California leads the nation in girls 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, undergoing bilateral mastectomy to no benefit. Girls are not benefited. You will hear advocates say, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? Asserting that allowing this girl to transition improves her mental outcomes. It does not. We now have conclusive evidence of no benefit to transitioning. And one of the world's most welcoming countries for transgender individuals, Denmark, where transition is fully paid for by the government, doesn't cost you a penny to have gender affirmation surgery or hormonal treatment or both. They also have a national health system where they're keeping tabs on every citizen lifelong. And in this study, they looked at, okay, who's trans and followed them over 40 years from 1980 through 2021 and found that transgender individuals are more than three times as likely after undergoing transition, more than three times as likely to commit suicide compared to non-trans individuals. And remarkably, transgender individuals after undergoing transition are twice as likely to die from other causes other than suicide. It's a very dangerous thing to be transgender. It's mean you're condemning yourself to a life of cross-sex hormones. It's not a good thing. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It doesn't say black and white, he created them. It doesn't say Asian and Hispanic, he created them. Black, white, Asian, and Hispanic are indeed man-made constructs. But male and female are of God. Male and female are hardwired. Those hardwired differences are innate. Knowledge of those differences is not innate. Now, every culture, almost every culture, of which we have any record, takes very seriously the task of teaching girls to be women and boys to be men. 
And I met with David Gilmore in writing my book, Boys Adrift, Comparative Anthropologists, and I asked him, what do enduring cultures have in common? Is there anything they have in common? If you ask that question in terms of what they eat or drink or how they dress or even what their religious beliefs are, the answer is no. There's nothing that all enduring cultures share on those parameters, but there is one thing the anthropologists tell us that all enduring cultures do share, and that is that every culture that lasts has communities of women for girls and communities of men for boys. So that's a photograph of Kinoda. If you know only a little about the Navajo and you say, well, what's, and someone asks you, what's Kinoda? You say, what's well, a rite of passage? When a Navajo girl experiences her first menstrual period, she stays in the home of her grandmother for four days and four nights. And during those four days and nights, all of her adult female relatives call on her, aunts, cousins, and she demonstrates to them that she has indeed mastered the arts and crafts of Kenoda, the arts and crafts that are taught by Navajo women to Navajo girls and only to girls and not to the boys. And that's true enough as far as it goes, but it's more than a rite of passage, it's a process. But it's been going on usually two, three, four years by the time the girl actually has her first menstrual period. And incidentally, mom plays very little role. It's the grandmothers and women of the grandmothers generation who take the lead here. You have a community of women for girls. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard of bar mitzvah. If you're not connected to anyone in the Orthodox community, you may not know that in the Orthodox community, every aspect of religious life is single sex. The men and, worship, men and boys worship here. There's a barrier. The girls and women worship over there. Every Saturday in Orthodox synagogues worldwide, you read a particular portion from the five books of Moses, and that is the same in every synagogue on the planet. You know exactly what they'll be reading this Saturday. When you finish the last chapter of Deuteronomy, and you're going to start over next week with Genesis 1-1, that night all the men stay up Festival of Simchat Torah. All the men stay up, typically all night, dusk till dawn, singing and dancing. You have older men with younger men with boys. You have a community of men for boys. That's not that boy's father. It's another man in the synagogue teaching this boy. This is what we expect of a Jewish man. This is what is expected. This is what it means to be a Jewish man. You have a woman teaching a girl. This is what it means to be a Jewish woman. Now, what that woman is teaching that girl is very different from what the Navajo women are teaching the Navajo girl. The content is almost completely different, but the process is the same. In every enduring culture, you have a community of men for boys, a community of women for girls. I'm not talking about teaching math, science, language, arts, social studies. Men can teach that content to girls. Women can teach that content to boys. I'm talking about the question of what does it mean to be a man? has to be taught by men. What does it mean to be a woman? has to be taught by a woman. It's not primarily about father, daughter, mother, son. You need a community of men for boys and a community of women for girls. And we used to do that. By we, I mean Americans who speak English at home. And this is not a guess and it's not nostalgia. We have scholars like Robert Putnam who spent decades leading an army of graduate students across the United States, conducting structured interviews, over 200,000 structured interviews, finding that 50 years ago, you could go into any neighborhood in the United States and you'd find a sewing circle organized not by kin relation, but by geographic proximity, which is a fancy way of saying that the women and girls in the sewing circle were not related to each other. They just happened to live on the same block. He documents not only formal associations like the Elks and the Moose, but informal associations. So he's got a photograph of some guys working in the hood of a car in Lake Forest, Illinois in 1967. And his graduate students dig up, okay, who are those men and who are those boys? What are their names? What are their ages? And you find there were older men, younger men, and teenage boys. Drive around the United States today and you might actually see two old geezers working in the hood of their 65 Corvette, but the boys are not with them. The boys are indoors playing video games. The bonds across generations have been broken. Bowling used to be more popular in the United States, but more impor importantly, from Dr. Putnam's perspective, it was done differently. 
50 years ago, most of the bowling was in bowling leagues. And Tuesday night might be the women's night, and Thursday night was the men's night. And he and his students dig up, all right, who was in the bowling league in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, in 1968? Well, let's see. On this particular team, there was a 53-year-old woman, a 37-year-old woman, a 26-year-old woman, a 17-year-old girl, and a 12-year-old girl. Kids in the United States still go bowling, but they go bowling alone, to borrow the title of Dr. Putnam's best-known book, meaning not literally alone, but instead of this girl going bowling with a community of women, she's going bowling with a bunch of teenagers, girls and boys mixed together, which as far as Dr. Putnam is concerned, is bowling alone. When Dr. Putnam uses the term community, he means bonds across generations, and the bonds across generations have been broken. Kids now prefer to hang out with same age peers. We no longer have those communities of men for boys or women for girls. And the American popular culture now deliberately undermines and confuses male and female. For example, Neuberth, who won the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, uh, goes by the name Conchita, deliberately trying to confuse you about what, what are you looking at here? Is this a man? Is this a woman? Deliberately trying to confuse the categories of male and female. Winner of the Eurovision Song Contest. You need to create opportunities for boys to be with men. Create opportunities for girls to be with women. Celebrate gender differences while insisting on equal opportunity for women and men. What does this actually look like? Sounds fine in theory, but what does it look like in practice? Well, Reverend James uh, lives east of Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. Give me an example. So the church doesn't run this. The church creates a forum for the women to gather and meet each other, but the, the cost of this is paid by the, the women involved. Eight women and eight girls gather at the headwaters of the Namakegan River in Wisconsin and canoe down to the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. Now that is maintained by the National Park Service. There are campsites accessible only by the water. And each half day, one girl gets in the canoe with one woman and they canoe for two hours and then pull off at the campsite for lunch and then have lunch together and then do it again in the afternoon with a different woman and then pull off at another campsite for the evening, make their camp, make their campfire, sit around the campfire, tell stories. That's a great opportunity to create connections across generations. Three days, two nights, and they shared with me some photos. It's very, very beautiful, I'm told. The church publicizes the trip. But the parents do the heavy lifting, transportation, supplies, volunteers. Do a similar event for boys. One church in Colorado does the Snake River in the Northwest Territories in Northern Canada for 10 days. They originally did 10 days for boys and 10 days for girls, but many of the girls rebelled when they found out there's no toilet. <laughs> you dig a hole and you aim and you leave no trace. Um, so the church now does the girls' trip on the Colorado River where there are toilet facilities. Don't underestimate the willingness of girls to do this. So Academy of the Holy Names uh, in Tampa, Florida, a Catholic school, one of the parents heard about this woman, not connected to the school, but a lower income woman who had fallen between the cracks, not poor enough to qualify for government assistance, but by no means wealthy enough to repair her home, which is falling apart and needs lots of repairs. So the school challenged the girls and said, who wants to serve? Who wants to devote their spring break to fixing up this woman's home? And 16 girls volunteered along with three women none of whom are employed by the school. The school just created a venue for people to learn about this. And the girls had a great time. And they went up on the roof and fixed the roof. It has to be all girls. If you do this as a co-ed group, we live in a sexist culture. And teachers have told me how frustrated they are because the boys are going up on the roof. And the girl's are like, oh, I'm scared. And Eric really wants to, so he can do it. 
and the boys are fixing the toilet and the girls are painting the flower boxes. They're reinforcing gender stereotypes. Very little is account. When it's all girls, the girls are empowered and they realize, you know what? <laughs> we can fix a roof. We don't need boys. We can change a toilet. Two girls can lift a toilet and remove it and put in a new toilet. It's not that hard. The girls created a, a design and executed a sweatshirt saying you give a little when you give possessions, give yourself and you truly give. And that's what the house looked like when they were finished. And there's the owner surrounded by the girls. The girls had a great time. Highland School is a co-ed Catholic school near Dallas, but they had the same idea. What does it mean to be a man? It means to use your strength in the service of others. That's the lesson they were trying to teach. So they went down to a church that had been uh, ruined in a hurricane, had been sitting in slime and uh, mud for months, and they learned how you clean that up, how you fix it up, and they had a great time. Boys with men. Now, I don't know what this man is looking at on his laptop, but I assure you it's not pornography. He's teaching the boys, this is what it means to be a man. It means you use your strength in the service of others. You'll find much more on this topic in my book, Why Gender Matters, also in Boys Adrift and Girls on the Edge. All of my books are available as audiobooks. I auditioned to read them. They turned me down. They didn't like my voice. <laughs> if you found this message useful and you know of another group that might be interested, I hope you'll come up front, grab a, grab a business card. I hope you'll take a look at my uh, website, leonardsachs.com. Take a look at some of the other presentations. Beyond Resilience has been very popular uh, recently. Likewise, Boys Adrift and Girls on the Edge. The handout for this talk is online. The link is my name, leonardsachs.com slash jsarah, the number two dot PDF. It is case sensitive. It is all lower the case, all lowercase, and you must include the dot PDF. We have about seven minutes for your comments, questions, thoughts, or stories you'd like to share. Yes, ma'am. I'm a J. Sarah parent, and um, this isn't a J. Sarah sanctioned kind of thing that I'm going to say, but we have a petition that we're getting signed in the state of California because they're doing transgender surgeries on our children starting out age 12 without parental consent. Um, they change the age, and um, you are prevented from knowing your children's medical history at age 12. So um, this is legislation that's passed, and even though our kids are in this wonderful environment, not all kids are, and this is about preserving the future and these children. Their brains aren't fully developed, and I just want to say thank you so much for being so brave, and I want to thank Jay Sarah. I just love this school. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm writing a revised edition of The Collapse of Parenting, which now has a new chapter titled Babies. Begins with a story at uh, Trinity United Presbyterian Church in Santa Ana, where I led two days of workshops. That's 12 hours of Leonard Sachs over two days. That's a lot. But I do have some real fans, a few, uh, who attended all 12 hours. And, you know, you get to know each other during the breaks and the intervals in between. And one teacher shared with me, she's teaching at an elementary school there in Santa Ana, Orange County. And uh, she and her husband have been trying to get pregnant for three years. And she finally, they finally succeeded. And she's pregnant. And she's really excited. And finishing her first trimester, she said to a colleague at school, she said to one of the other teachers, she said, we just found out I'm having a boy. And her colleague said, don't you think you should let the baby decide? <laughs> and that's the thing now. Other comments, other questions about anything I have spoken about this evening? Yes. Hi, I have um, one child still here, but two that are older. And my daughter did Girl Scouts. My son did Boy Scouts. While he was in his last year and he hit Eagle Scout, I know the Boy Scouts of America changed mm -hmm. and they now allow girls. Yes. 
co-ed. That's co-ed. And, and my daughter, you know, we've had discussions because her big thing with Girl Scouts is they didn't do a lot of the things that she saw her brother getting to do because she likes camping. She wants to do all those things. But, I, but what you were sharing about how it, it, you know, I saw it was really great for them to be able to be with the same sex you know, in a group and, and be comfortable doing the things that they were doing. I, I guess I just wish that, you know, the boys could have done more art projects or whatever, vice versa. But if you do, you have any thoughts about that? I know there's, yeah. you know, it's, probably, it's a done deal. Yeah. But. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was tremendously disappointed by the Boy Scouts. What happened was that they saw their enrollment decline, that uh, the there were fewer and fewer boys choosing to be Boy Scouts. So they hired a consulting firm and the consulting firm did focus groups with teenage boys and said, what would you like to be doing in your spare time? And the boys said, oh, it'd be fun to do stuff with girls. So the Boy Scouts said, okay, great. Yep, we'll do it. Uh, we'll make uh, Boy Scouts co-ed. Um, it was a, a tremendous failure to understand what the mission of the Boy Scouts could be to teach boys to be good men, to connect them with good male role models at a time when good real mo male role models are sorely lacking in the popular culture. You won't find them in Drake, Bruno Mars, Akon, Eminem. Um, so I think it's a shame now Boy Scout troops differ. There are still some scouts that I think are doing a great job. And I'm always disappointed to hear of Girl Scouts who aren't doing camping because they're supposed to. That's really all through their website and their mission statement. Um, you can use the single sex format to break down gender stereotypes so that girls can fix groups and change toilets and go camping without any men and get that affirmation and empowerment that you know, we don't need the men to start a campfire. Uh, or to feed ourselves. Um, so, um, and there are still some good uh, troops out there that are doing it, but I think there's been a society-wide failure to understand the challenge and to meet the challenge. Other comments, other questions, yes. Um, you touched on motivation for the half brain 15 year old. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is there anything that you could spend just a couple minutes talking about what we could do to help them feel more motivated at that age. You're talking about the boy who is unmotivated. The boy who Sorry. is doing well in school, doing well, you know, checking all the boxes, but just in general, just likes to, and doesn't play video games, so that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. So just maybe motivation. So you're talking about motivation in school. Okay. Okay. So that is the major question that I do try to address in my book, Boys Adrift. The subtitle is The Five Factors Driving the Growing Epidemic of Unmotivated Boys and Underachieving Young Men. But I would say the most important thing you need to do is to find a school that understands the differences, uh, which doesn't have to be a boys' school. It, it can be a co school, but it needs to be a school where teachers understand the differences, understand that the best way to get boys excited about Jane Eyre and Emily Dickinson is different from the best way to get girls excited about Jane Eyre and Emily Dickinson. And very, very often in my practice as a family doctor, I've seen that the boy who is unmotivated and disengaged at one school can become engaged and scholarly and motivated at a different school with the right teachers. And I've had the privilege of meeting with teachers at this school, and they're very interested and very enthusiastic about understanding what turns boys on? How do you engage and motivate boys? So my time is up. I'm going to thank you for your time and attention, and I hope we'll be in touch. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sachs, for being with us. And thank you for spending the whole day with us. Um, if you're uh, interested in hearing Dr. Sachs again, he's also put, he's put some things on his website. I encourage you, if you haven't read his books, especially if you're interested in the male-female differences, um, all three of the books that treat that topic, Why Gender Matters, Boys Adrift, and Girls on the Edge, are excellent and give you a deeper dive than even he went into today. So um, thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again in August. Another round of applause for Dr. Sachs. 
And thank you for coming out and supporting us in these events. We're really trying to do everything we can at Chase Sarah to, to build young men and women of character. But we're also trying to do as much as we can to share our gifts with the broader community and, and help support parents in South Orange County. So spread the word when you hear about these events. Get on our Adelante page. Adelante is our adult page, and those are for you. And we hope to see you next time, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank <laughs> you.